I began last week with talk of imagination and the relation between the release of imagination and the pursuit of identity. I was trying to call attention to the breakthroughs that occur, to the upsurges of the unexpected we may experience at certain moments of engagement with works of art. Most of us can summon up such moments. They may be associated with a scene in a play, like Twelfth Night, maybe, or Death of a Salesman, or a Doll's House, with a movement in a string quartet, with some lines in a poem, a wild surmise, or they said you have a blue guitar, you do not play things as they are, or with the startling images of an Irish town as in Angela's ashes, if not portrait of the artist as a young man. We experience a sense of surprise, oftentimes, an acute sense that things may look otherwise, feel otherwise, be otherwise than we have assumed. <clears throat> and suddenly the world seems new, with possibilities still to be explored. It seems obvious to me that shocks of awareness of that sort can be of great significance for learning in a world so characterized by routines, by a kind of drab everydayness. I quoted Mary Warnock saying that the greatest obstacle to the kind of education we seek is boredom. Boredom comes, she says, when people feel they have come to the end of what is worth having. Numbers of you have commented on the empty eyes of some of the children in your schools. Uh, and I think we know what Mary Warnock means. I believe that too many people, including young people in many of our schools, resemble the citizens Albert Camus described in the play. The truth is that everyone is bored and devotes himself to cultivating habits. And then Camus went on to say that these habits were not peculiar to the town of Oran. Really, all our contemporaries are much the same. Certainly, nothing is commoner nowadays than to see people working from morn to night and then proceeding to fritter away at card tables in cafes and in small talk what time is left for living. Before thrusting this aside as a moral judgment against card playing, I think we're each bound to ask ourselves what he meant and more important, what we mean by living. In any case, he followed this by saying, there do still exist towns and countries where people have now and then an inkling of something different. That inkling is what I want to talk about. I want to suggest that works of art have a potential for in evoking an intimation of a better order of things. I mean, of course, a consciousness of possibility. You all know, however, that works of art do not spontaneously give rise to such a potential, that it only exists as a potential if there is a consciousness ready to respond to it. What we do here, by means of what we call aesthetic education, is to empower persons alone or in a community to know enough to notice what is there to be noticed when participating imaginatively in Crap's last tape, let us say. The same applies to the dances of the urban bushwomen or the odd shifts and rearrangements in Cunningham's scramble. It is not a matter of watching from a distance. Once caught up in the life of our workshops, we learn what active perceptual participation means as we learn more about the substance of the art form and the dimensions of the experienced world, engaging along with others, attending to the qualities of the work at hand, the unsteady, uneven rhythms of craps restless pacing, the sensuality, the whisper of the magical in the storyteller, the shades and nuances of bebop in the monk pieces, exploring for ourselves sound and movement, color against color, voice against voice, we may well find ourselves transformed. And then we have to ask in our reflective, in our reflective phase, how did it happen? 
What does it mean? So many people have come to me and said my life was changed through the Lincoln Center Institute, and I'm happy to hear it, and I wonder what it means, and I wonder if they know what it means. Uh, what was there in that, how did, it, what, how did it happen? What was there about that combination of tones that pushed back the ordinary horizons of sound? What choices did Beckett make when it came to placing the memory of the Baltic and its pines and dunes so soon after his taking note of the 17 sales of his book. What does Cunningham mean when he says, I think of dance as a constant transformation of life itself. Can we say that about our projects, our searches for ourselves? What does it mean to say that a dance or a piece of music or a short story only becomes a work of art when it becomes an object of our experience? And when it does, how does it radiate through our transactions with the world? For John Dewey, the task of those who choose to write about the arts is to restore continuity between the refined and intensified forms of experience that are works of art and the everyday events, doings, and sufferings that are universally re recognized to constitute experience. In many respects, that's what we're trying to do here. We know that the capacity for responding, for instance, to metaphor has to be cultivated, just as does the capacity to respond to an as if, to a created and alternative reality. A metaphor may, in Virginia Woolf's terms, bring the severed parts together. It is what it does, says one writer. He goes on, the meaning of metaphorical discourse is nothing other than the practical transformation it brings in the listening and speaking subject the orientation it communicates to understanding. It provokes a change in the way we see things. It brings about a transformation. In my workshop, we've been studying Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse and the bringing unlike things together through the metaphors of window and lighthouse reoriented much of our thinking about addressing the world. The window, some of you may recall, summons up a wealth of meanings associated with domesticity, family care and connection, flickering perceptions of order and disorder and death, too complex to fit into a rational category. It exists in tension with the lighthouse, a principle of order, of direction, a shape of stern resolution standing there to be achieved. To view them as feminine and masculine symbols is to drain them of the significance within and outside the book a significance due to the almost endless possibilities that many, uh, that many sided search for order, for harmony opens in our consciousness. Without metaphor, it would be difficult to explain the transformations brought about by imagination. For it is through imagination, writes G.B. Madison, the realm of pure possibility that we freely make ourselves to be who or what we are, that we creatively and imaginatively become what we, who we are, while in the process preserving the freedom and possibility to be yet otherwise than what we have become and merely are. I'd probably stress more than he does the idea of the self in process, but the notion of a realm of possibility with relevance for all those we teach and whom we hope to liberate someday connects for me for what we do with what we do here at the Institute. And it makes me want to reimagine the purposes of education here and in the schools around to invent situations in which young people are enabled freely to make of themselves to be who or what they are, that they could become creatively what they are. And that means in part 
an infusion of their teaching learning situations with opportunities to engage continually, yes, and knowledgeably with works of art. I remember Dewey writing that personal responses involving imagination can lead to real understanding even of what are called facts. And then he said, the engagement of the imagination is the only thing that makes any activity more than mechanical. It was a matter of recognizing the role of imaginative vision, a capacity we believe can be released and nurtured through active learning in the several arts. It is always important, I think, to keep in mind the importance of attending and the recognition that the more we know, the more we see and hear and notice and even feel. I want to speak for a minute about opening spaces in our classrooms, more and more spaces where people can appear as who they are and not what they are, spaces for action on the part of all involved. Hannah Arendt made very clear that action, in contrast to behavior, means taking an initiative, embarking on a beginning, setting something in motion. It is, she said, in the nature of beginning that something new is started, which cannot be ex expected from whatever may have happened before. This character of startling unexpectedness is inherent in all beginning. I'm eager to say and say again how much this has to do with aesthetic discoveries and experiences some of us are living through and the effect it can have on the spaces we open, how much it has to do with encouraging a sense of agency on the part of teachers and learners both. Concerned as I am with going beyond the schoolroom space into the larger spaces where we look for communities in the making, for in other words, democracy, I want to say a word about the meanings of what we are doing for the larger community. I find pointers in the work, among others, of the poet Adrian Rich very much troubled, as so many of us are or ought to be, by the carelessness and the desperation in our society. She spoke of the different kinds of dread being suffered by different people. She had in mind such human beings as welfare mothers, the unemployed, the neglected children and old people, the victims of violence. And she said, when interviewed by Bill Moyers, that she thought more and more people feel uncared for, feel that their lives are not only unvalued but meaningless, feel that though they may care for their lives, no one else will, feel that the only way they can protect their survival and interests is by the gun. I am, I am afraid, she said, that many people feel an enormous desperation which plays into the propaganda of hate. She was asked how she could reconcile such bitterness with the affirmations in her poems. And she said something of great significance, I think, for our understanding of art and the possibilities that open for us. If poetry is forced by the conditions in which it's created, to speak of dread and of bitter, bitter conditions, by its very nature, poetry speaks beyond to something different. That's why poetry can bring together those parts of us which exist in dread and those which have the surviving sense of a possible happiness, a collectivity, community, a loss of isolation. I believe that possibility is inherent, or at least potential, in our experiences with many works of art, including Merce Cunningham's work and Thelonious Monk's and Meredith Monk's. Part of our obligation, after all, is to find out what can be done in our lives with young people to lessen the dread 
to resist the undervaluing of their lives. Some of us reading children's poetry, looking at their journals, know the forms that dread and feeling uncared for can take. Without calling the arts remedial or in any way therapeutic, we still can introduce these works to which the young respond and pay heed to the bringing together of those parts of us which exist in dread and those which have a surviving sense of a possible happiness, collectivity, community, a loss of isolation. I think of Mike Rose's book, Possible Lives, he calls it, and very happily, and maybe by coincidence, he quotes me because I once used the word possibilize. He doesn't mention anything more, but he does say that. And his telling of schools that indeed speak beyond, he says, to something different. I keep recalling the principal he interviews describing a trip his kids took with New York City's chief engineer through the city's water tunnels until they all realized how important water was for the life of the city. And then, said the principal, we read poetry together, and I never thought engineering and poetry could be connected. He concluded by saying how much he believed in people making a future for themselves. We want, he said, to open kids up to all the possibilities of learning and to do it with a variety of people who have widely different uh, perspectives on things. And then I think of Paolo Freire, recently and very sadly deceased, writing about the ways in which people could break through what he called the culture of silence by developing a discourse, he said, that finally showed them that the lovelier world to which they aspired was being announced, somehow anticipated in their imagination. He knew it too. It was not a matter of idealism. Imagination and conjecture about a different world than the one of oppression are as necessary to practice and the transformation of reality as it is to the worker or the artisan who first has to have in his head a design, a conjecture of what she or he is about to make. It's not an accident that Paolo found his model in the creative person, in the artisan or worker or artist. He called me several times when I asked him to a conference, and once he asked, how did I know he was so interested in the arts? It was easy to guess by reading his work on, on the pedagogy of oppression, of the oppressed, for him, breaking with the silences, naming, making, becoming increasingly conscious. There are, these are the tasks of democratic popular education, a pedagogy of hope, he said. For Paolo, hopelessness was a form of silence. Hope is literate, articulate. If I fight with hope, he said, I can wait. Deborah Meyer, too, has talked of and written about opening spaces for imagination for teachers as well as the young, and linked it not only with the arts, but with a shaping of a culture marked by compassion and care. There is much that still has to be said, but I hope you know we are not alone. Many of those who speak for imagination, possibility, the kindling of hope, and engagement with the arts are sounding chords great artists of the past have sounded repeatedly. The musicians, Bach and Beethoven and Mahler, each has her own list. The painters, Cezanne and Rothko and Van Gogh and Mary Cassatt, writers like Dostoevsky, Melville, Toni Morrison, Doctorow, they are chords, themes, that remind us of the need to acknowledge the darkness and working against that darkness, to conjecture, to design, to protest, to imagine, to transform. 
I ponder, who can escape pondering the violations of children, the abuse of children we hear about almost every day? And I have to turn not to the New York Times or to the social work journals or even the philosophy journals, but to an artist, in this case Dostoevsky, to provide words for the questioning throbbing in us all. There is a scene in the Brothers Karamazov in which Ivan Karamazov is talking to his brother Alyosha about the tormenting of children. People who do that may behave benevolently to other human beings, he says, like all cultivated and humane Europeans, but they are very fond of tormenting children, even fond of children themselves in that sense. But it is just the children's defenselessness that tempts the tormentor. And you may remember that Ivan then says that with his pitiful earthly Euclidean understanding, all he knows is, is, is that there is suffering and that there are none guilty, that cause follows effect, that everything finds its own level. That's technicist thinking that can be tested by multiple choice tests. Uh, that's only Euclidean nonsense, he says. I know that, and I can't consent to live by it. And he keeps asking, what am I to do about the children? Listen, if all must suffer to pay for the eternal harmony, what have children to do with it? Tell me, please. And then he says, I don't want harmony. Uh, uh, for, uh, from love of humanity, I don't want it. I would rather be left with my unavenged suffering and unsatisfied indignation, even if I were wrong. And by harmony means, you know, a surface peace and everybody comfortable and so on. Besides, too high a price is asked for harmony. It's beyond our means to pay so much to enter on it. And so I hasten to give my entrance ticket back. And that is what I am doing. He is refusing, he says, to accept other people's happiness on the foundation of the suffering of children, of even one tiny victim crying unavenged tears. Think about some of the children in this city. Read Dostoevsky and ask yourself about the uses of art, of the imaginative vision. It seems so clear to me that it is indeed art that brings the parts of us, perhaps even the parts of our community together. For Jean-Paul Sartre, a paragraph like that appeals to our freedom or to our indignation. Certainly it must nudge us out of somnolence and move us somehow to choose to act, to engage in a beginning. At the very least, Dostoevsky is doing much more than asking us to write letters of protest or join picket lines, but he is arousing us from a kind of slumber once we come to him through an act of imagination. As artist, he is making us feel the demand in the face of a child, acting in a way that affirms the feeling, I choose to be here for you. All of us reaching into our past can recall ways of encountering the human condition through the arts. Jacob Lawrence's migration series, those renderings of Afro-Americans moving up from the South in the 1920s, as Toni Morrison's characters do, hoping to find dreams come true in the chill of Chicago and New York. There are Edward Hopper's solitary figures in hotel rooms and luncheonettes etched by direct light and the sparest of lines speaking a visual language that comes before words. We need to keep reminding ourselves of the part played by imagination as we continue learning to attend, learning to notice, learning to see. And somehow this makes me think back to John Keats again, saying, I will call the world a school instituted for the purpose of teaching little children to read. Do you not see how necessary a world of pains and troubles is to school and intelligence 
and make it a soul? That's not bad education for a soul. Perhaps that can feed into the making of our purposes too. Thinking about and yearning for an extension of what we're doing into the public space where we hope to see a community in the making, I choose to return to Adrian Rich for still another beginning, another reminder, another posing of questions, and it's a little poem called In, Those, in These Years. In these years, people will say, we lost track of the meaning of we, of you. If we found ourselves reduced to I, <clears throat> and the whole thing became silly, ironic, terrible. We were trying to lead a personal life, and yes, that was the only life we could bear witness to. But the great dark birds of history screamed and plunged into our personal weather, they were headed somewhere else, but their beaks and pinions drove along the shore through the rags of fog where we stood saying, I, and the questions come, and thank you very much. I want to begin by reminding everybody how much has changed since our beginnings when we were bound to argue against the neglect of the arts and education, <clears throat> the belief that they nurtured only affective and intuitive capacities, and the widely held conviction that they were frivolous subjects, fringe subjects, irrelevant in a competency-based school. They appeared to have little or anything to do, in fact, with the obligation to educate the young often called human resources for an emerging technological society, one committed to gaining military as well as economic primacy in the world. In this day of arts partnerships and a range of reform movements, the arts seem to have found a new centrality in educational discussions. More and more frequently, art education is being linked to aesthetic education or efforts like ours to make possible, reflective, discriminating encounters with all the languages of art. Museums, theaters, concert halls, neighborhood groups, all in various ways are moving into relationships with public schools. Literacy programs are opening to the arts. Our artists' alliances and other organizations are interested in finding out what they can do in public school and even now and then in higher education. When I think of partnerships, however, whatever form they take, I can't think of institutions in collaboration. Rather, I think of individual persons, teachers, artists, art administrators, art supervisors, parents. Primarily, I think of teachers because so much depends upon them. From my point of view, teachers never had so much responsibility where the development of authentic arts programs and practices is concerned. You're the people who have to be the generators of real change, significant and humane change. I've been asked many times lately to speak about a common language, a language that will enable all those involved to communicate with one another without losing in translation the concerns, the values, the meanings that define each undertaking and give it its distinctiveness. That has made me associate to the title of a collection of Adrian Rich's poetry, The Dream of a Common Language. To conceive it as a dream, of course, is to imagine it as something still out of reach. I like to think of those of us participating in the Institute as dreamers in Adrian Rich's sense. Also, I like to think of the multiple activities here as giving rise to dialogues about, to thinking about what a common language might mean. If it is the case, for example, that the languages of art cannot be translated into one another, and some very important thinkers have said they cannot, 
How would you find a common language that articulates something fundamental to all of them, to dance, music, theater, literature, without reducing any one of them to a uniform symbol system? How would you find the kind of language that enables practicing artists to speak with teachers, administrators to speak with artists, supervisors, community representatives, parents, immigrants, and other newcomers, men and women of different social classes. Adrian Rich writes, but there come times, perhaps this is one of them, when we have to take ourselves more seriously or die, when we have to pull back from the incantations, rhythms we've moved to thoughtlessly, and disenthrall ourselves, bestow ourselves to silence or to a severer listening, cleansed of oratory, formulas, choruses, laments, static crowding of the wires. I think that's so important, cleansed of formulas and, uh, and choruses. Writing, she probably without intention was charging people like us to break with the pious talk, the bureaucratic talk, the media talk, with what Dewey called the crust of conventionalized and routine consciousness. He was always critical of the routine, the thoughtless, the mechanical, and what he called the anesthetic, which he said was the opposite of aesthetic, meaning the banal, the repetitive, the solidified. I hate to think about it, but I'm sure there are places who pride themselves on teaching anesthetic education. I, I, I don't like to admit it, but I've heard a lot of such language in my years in teacher education. Much of it was linked to the preoccupation with measurement, of course, with quantitative research, the counting or the category making syndrome. Much of it, I suspect, was a function of bureaucracy. We've all had experiences with the difficulty of talking as who we are in our own voices to those who view themselves as our superior officers or in some context of what Hannah Arendt called rule by nobody. Dewey, in The Public and Its Problems, and I've quoted this before, described the superficial plane where so many people form their opinions and make their judgments. But he went on to say, our lives reach a deeper level that only art can touch. It is after all one of the functions of art to break through the crusts and routines, to awaken us and enhance our being in the world. Common things, wrote Dewey, a flower, a gleam of moonlight, the song of a bird, not things rare and remote, are means with which the deeper levels of life are touched so that they spring up as desire and thought. Poetry, the drama, the novel, are proofs that the problem of presentation is not insoluble. He meant the problem of articulating or expressing what may seem incommunicable in ordinary matter-of-fact prose. Artists, he went on, have always been the true purveyors of the news, for it is not the outward happening in itself which is new, but the kindling by it of emotion, perception, and appreciation. Some of us have discovered, and some of us will discover, that aware encounters with art forms from either the creative or the appreciative point of view are what make all sorts of awakenings possible. It is after such moments of awakening, moments of unconcealment, that we find ourselves noticing the flowers, the moonlight, the bird songs, those common things that touch the deeper levels of life. And indeed, that is one of our hopes, our ends of view here at the Institute, attending to Limon's The Winged in its particularity yesterday help to notice what is there to be noticed. We will not only unconceal aspects of the body making shapes in space and time and what shapes they made, but the fluid soaring and descending of birds, a magic of movement never suspected before. 
and perhaps we might hear or imagine the song of a bird resonating on the deeper levels of life. I've said often that the ability to release imagination makes such occasions more likely and more frequent. Imagination is the ability to look at things as if they could be otherwise, to conjure up the as-if world of the tango, of the interplanetary space of a wrinkle in time, to realize through such encounters that there is more in experience than can be predicted. It is through imagination, writes one philosopher, the realm of pure possibility that we freely make ourselves to be who or what we are, that we creatively and imaginatively become what we are, while in the process preserving the freedom and possibility to be yet otherwise than we have become and merely are. Think of what that means for teaching and learning, the suggestion that imagination allows us to reach beyond, to reach, not toward the predictable, but toward the possible. It is as important for those of us who teach as it can be for those we hope will become different by learning to learn. The idea that the arts silently call out to us, as Rilke wrote, we can change our lives, that children's lives may be transformed through engagement with art forms accessible to them, poses a great challenge to the teacher. It's not the incorporation of aesthetic education into the school's curricula that makes the significant difference. It is the teacher who makes the difference, her or his own cherishing of experiences with the arts, her or his own reflections on the way particular encounters of open vistas revealed alternative ways of living and being, exposed some of the ultimate mysteries, the concluding moments of Ionescu's The Chairs comes back to me. They come after that hectic assembling of chairs on the stage, chairs which turn out to be empty. Suddenly a bright light comes on at the back of the stage, so bright that members of the audience cover their eyes and rear back in their seats. Something has been disclosed something the audience is not sure it wants to know. And yet at the end, the, we are moved to say to ourselves, I see. It is because of the need for a teacher's active engagement, because of her or his willingness to take risks, to pose the questions, to love the questions, to realize, as James Baldwin said, that the questions are too often covered up by the answers, that I believe partnership must entail face-to-face -face relationships and the kind of dialogue such relationships make possible. Again, I turn to poetry to suggest what this implies. This time, Muriel Rukeyser's effort at speech between two people. Each verse begins with a variation on speak to me, take my hand, where are you now? Here is the last verse, what are you now? If we could touch one another, if these are separate entities could come to grips clenched like a Chinese puzzle. Yesterday I stood in a crowded street that was alive with people and no one spoke a word and the morning shone, everyone silent, moving, take my hand, speak to me. Promising as are the emergent relations between arts organizations and schools coming together in the hope of school renewal and reform, there's always the danger of estrangement, like the feeling of standing in a crowded street with no one to speak to, no one who knows your name. There has to be talk about the throbbing difficult questions, talk about the meanings of art, the impacts of popular culture, the distances that seem to yawn between a theater most of us esteem and the films and concerts young people choose to attend, the videos they buy, the CDs they relish, oftentimes ones of which we've never heard. 
Remember the youngsters who went to see Titanic, sometimes six, sometimes 13 times, and they thought they were having a first level aesthetic experience, and maybe they were. Remember the youngsters, uh, re recall some of the rap music discs that white adolescents buy all over the country. How do we honor what they esteem and at once offer possibilities of what we're convinced may be a heightened, more many-faceted life. How do we open our own imaginations to work we don't care for on first viewing, on first hearing? How important is it for us to like what may be an aesthetic experience for others or described as one? How necessary is it for our students to like what we have to offer them. Most important, I believe, is a widening of our grasp, a more intense opening to the world and its multiple offerings, and at once a greater order with regard to what we treasure, what we hope to share. What of the teachers who still dread the free fall, the chances they may take as they ponder experiences they've never taken into account before? What of those who still teach to the tests in order to ensure predictability, the ones who need to measure in order to justify what they do? What of those who conceive standards as predefined to be imposed authoritatively from above? What of those immersed in what we call instrumental rationality, seeing themselves as molding the young, treating them as resources for the state, for the business community, for the new technologies, not as existing persons in quest of some significant life, wanting to go beyond having, perhaps wanting to be. When we link aesthetic education to conceptions of a different sort of teaching, to what we call school renewal or school reform, I think we have to remember that there are at least three approaches to reform these days, perhaps more. There's the one connected to Goals 2000, centered mainly on an increased general literacy for the sake of readying the new generation for a millennium, I've begun to hate the word millennium, for a <laughs> millennium governed by the new technologies linked by more and more complicated internets responding to free market ideologies. Or there's the one connected to the Christian right, ostensibly occupied with family values, virtue, character education, abstinence, chastity, prayer in schools, school choice, and with protection of the young against abortion and homosexuality, the theory of evolution sometimes, suspicions of pornography. And then there is the reform that continues the experiential tradition stemming from Rousseau and Pestalozzi and Emerson and Furbel, moving on to Dewey and Bruner and Gardner and Duckworth and others familiar to those of you who have kept in touch with that stream in American history running in the direction of personal liberation, awareness, and in time, a humane face-to-face -face community. I say that, I remind you of that, because I, I, want, I, I want to share with you my feeling that it's still going to be a struggle. It's always been a struggle to keep that tradition alive and that you're part of something that's been very important in American history and hasn't yet been won. Uh, and here in the Institute and afterward, I think you have to realize that you're carrying on, if you believe in it, something more important than what is carelessly called school reform. I, I say all this because I believe it's so important for us to be informed enough to choose, to recognize what stands in the way of experience say we've had and will have with the winged or Corelli or the ballet, to be clear and articulate about why we feel those moments are valuable. We can't take for granted a widespread agreement in the educational community on the need for the centrality of imagination. 
we can't simply assume that all our colleagues appreciate the wonder of an aesthetic encounter, of bringing a work of art to life and experience. I hear too many arguing still that the value of such experience is to be found in the contribution it makes to raising standards or improving, achieve, achieve, improving achievement in mathematics or social studies or even, even, uh, even, even, the, even the sciences. I always worry if I lose page seven, I'll forget entirely what I meant to say. <laughs> that, or ask somebody else to write it. That may be, uh, it may be that, the, that aesthetic education feeds into other learning. We know how the presence of the arts can alter the atmosphere in a school, can intensify curiosity and attentiveness. We know the integral role of reaching towards something better in the lives of artists, the sense that there always remains some fulfillment some vision still to be attained. To, to see what standards are, I always think you have to attend to some of our teaching artists to feel their responsiveness to some internalized idea of how things ought to be. We know the necessity, uh, the sensitivity to manner, to style, to the necessity of rigor the kind of rigor that makes possible the wonders created, say, by the Limon dancers yesterday. But there remains for me the power of works of art to change our lives, to enable us to feel more, see more, hear more, make meanings never thought about before. It's not the function of the arts to offer uh, 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 answers or testable knowledge. It's not the function of those who teach to come into classrooms with reassuring answers or guarantees of any kind. Novels for me, Paradise Lost or Cold Mountain or As I Lay Dying, which I'm uh, suddenly reading again, uh, or great plays, I think of The Doll's House a year or two ago, or The Beauty Queen of Leonine, or of A View from the Bridge, even certain paintings, Rembrandt's self-portraits, some of Vermeer's, Monet's Rouen Cathedral changing with each shaft of light, meaning differently with every change. I think of Mahler and Bartok and Philip Gloss trying now to forget his conservatory training and learn African ways of playing without writing the music down. They open question after question, making me love them as they make me strain in so many directions, make me feel increasingly uneasy and increasingly alive. As you're enabled to notice what er there is to be noticed in the works with which you engage this summer, as you discover more of what it means to live within the arts for a time and make more open spaces for yourself, I hope you'll feel the responsibility of finding out what it means for you, how it touches the deepest levels in your own life, and find your own words for saying so. So much is up to you, even in this moment of seeming triumph for art education. For some reason, I think of Monet again, this time of those lanes of poplar trees, also viewed in many perspectives, opening spaces, always new ones, for, for those, those of us who perceive, who have learned how to see. It is a metaphor for today, a kind of metaphor and that brings me finally to Seamus Haney in a poem he wrote called The Poplar. Wind shakes the big poplar, quicksilvering the whole tree in a single sweep. What bright scale fell and left this needle quivering? What loaded balances have come to grief? It's a beautiful notion for me of the scale balancing and the needle quivering uh, and uh, no equilibrium, no loaded balances. What does it really mean? I don't know if I know, but I know it raises questions. I know it makes me uneasy, and I know it makes me realize how much there still is for all of us to do. Thanks very much.
My themes, as many of you know, have to do with opening new pathways and lived experience and breaking with the taken for granted and setting aside the crusts of conformity. It takes work, as we know, as so many have reminded us, work to be done on the part of those of us who are perceivers, lending some of our lives to the works before us as we attend to and gather together the particulars, the details that are there for us. <clears throat> the one who is too lazy, idle, or indurated in convention, wrote Dr. John Dewey, will not see or hear. Jean-Paul Sartre, describing the mutual interdependence of artist and perceiver, talked about how we have to create what the artist discloses to us, to work along with the artist in bringing into being the universe of Hamlet, let us say, or Dr. Rose, the waterworks, or the wind as a knife. If, as Sattva said, we are inattentive, tired, stupid, or thoughtless, most of the relations will escape us. We will never manage to catch on to what is before us in the text, on the stage, on the wall, in the sense that fire catches or does not catch. Both Dewey and Sattva were paying tribute to the potential of those who come through their own free choosing to make certain works objects of their experience, to attend to them with the particular kind of effort that allows them to become works of art. It is, as you already recognize, the concern of the aesthetic educator to enable persons to exert that effort in whatever way they can to break with the automatic or with purely conventional norms, to awaken themselves from passivity so they do not simply wait to absorb. We have shared a number of experiences that make some of this particularly clear. I hope uh, they do. Friday afternoon, as those who were here recall, we saw the sky suddenly darken outside the windows, the clouds gather, and a storm begin. Watching the light change, the rain pour down for a few minutes, remembering what I said the other day about having aesthetic experiences with nature, I asked myself about the difference between what I was seeing outside the window and what, say, the painter Turner made me see when it came to storms or steam or mist, or the Hudson River painter rendering clouds gathering over the Catskills. And I thought about the haze in the hours before the rain here in the city, and about Monet's painting of mist in that work called Impression Mist. If Monet or Turner had been here on Friday and had been moved to make the look of the city the subject of a painting, we might have waited for a rendering of the storm as Turner or Monet saw it, but neither one would have captured it at the moment as we do with a snapshot. He would have kept looking, trying to see it all in terms of oil paint, pondering later what he had seen, finding new possibilities of color, a vaguely emergent form transfiguring what the storm we saw on 65th Street into a concretion, something called form content, something at last that never existed in the world before. And if we reached out to understand, to engage with the shapes and colors and relationships in his painting, we would discover a wholly new storm on 65th Street, something we could not conceivably have anticipated and perhaps something new about storminess and the meaning of sudden darkening, curtaining, storming in our experience, which might have changed that experience in some fashion, even as it altered our perceiving of city storms in time to come and offered us different perceptions of the city itself, 
perceptions that might play against one another, as they do when we read novels about the city, Toni Morrison's jazz or Dr. Rowe's work, making us ask ourselves, what do we here in the first person really see? I hope you think about the wonder of multiple perspectives in your own experience. I hope you think about what happens to you. And we would all hope to our students, when it becomes possible to abandon one-dimensional viewing, to look from many vantage points, and in doing so, construct meanings scarcely suspected before. That makes me think of another experience many of us shared, David Gonzalez telling the story of Orpheus and Eurydice. And because he tapped so many styles of sound and movement, moving us to actualize one of the most familiar tales there are in multiple and unfamiliar ways. Again, we had to be there with him, let our imaginations work so that in collaboration with him, we could make visible and palpable the musician Orpheus and the lost wife he goes in search of to the underground. We had to be personally participant, imaginatively participant, when he tried not to look back until he and Eurydice were back on Earth. We had ourselves to be drawn to look back to assure ourselves that the as if Eurydice were really there, even though we knew. What we shared was an enactment of art making, someone raising up a world before our eyes through movement and the sound of his voice and the expressions of his face. It reminded me of a Rilke poem called Imagine Initiation that begins with going out into the evening and lifting one's eyes from the worn out door stone and then slowly you raise a shadowy black tree and fix it on the sky, slender, alone, and you have made the world and it shall grow and ripen as a word unspoken still. When you have grasped its meaning with your will, then tenderly your eyes will let it go reminded me of it because it seemed to ask of me the same effort to raise something against the sky by means of my imagination and then choosing it in some way meaningful, making it my own. None of this means that you are required to like these works or that you are bound to discover openings within them. I'm pointing to suggesting to you the possibilities opened by imagination possibilities that something may happen in your experience, that something may open to a new way of seeing or feeling or coping with the world. I want to extend the point I'm trying to make about perceiving and imagining and opening to refer to another experience some of us shared, the listening to the Mendelssohn Octet which I realize sounds differently to different ones of us, which may well be heard differently, phrase by praise. I couldn't but recall an essay that's always meant a good deal to me. It is called Making Music Together and was written by a philosopher named Alfred Schutz. He looked at a performance like the one we heard the other day as a particular kind of web of social relationships, a mutual tuning in relationship by which he wrote, the I and thou are experienced by the participants as a we in vivid presence. He spoke of listeners coming into communication with a composer through the mediation of the performers. And he also spoke of, of the relation among the performers and the flux of tones unrolling in inner time as in, in an arrangement meaningful to composer and listener and performers because, and insofar as it evokes in the stream of consciousness participating in it, an interplay of recollections, retentions, protensions, and anticipations which interrelate the successive elements. He saw this as one of the best examples of persons communicating, becoming mutually concerned with one another, 
creating a relationship founded upon a common experience of living simultaneously in both inner and outer time. There are other ways of explaining the musical experience, but that is one that at least for me relates it to the other participatory experiences we're having here, and it once suggests what can happen in situations here and in our classrooms when by means of a performance, an enactment, a reading, or an exhibition, a we can emerge in vivid presence, something crucial to our lives. Now, I know, as all of us now concerned about cultural diversity know, that there are other kinds of music than the Mendelssohn, other kinds of arrangement in inner time. I know, for example, that the experience of listening to Indian music is different from the experience of listening to Mendelssohn. I know that the Indian aesthetic is different from ours, with its emphasis on an intuitive grasp of what is happening in an art form and a movement outward from that art form to a transcendence of the sensory world and an escape to a state of superior pleasure, practical betterment, and spiritual bliss. We will be in some way participant in Indian dance this week and to some extent the sounds that accompany it. And I would like to believe that for all the difference in aesthetic theory, we can still experience the I-thou moment Schutz described when listening to Indian music. It is interesting to read that dance and music are thought to outrank sculpture and painting in Indian culture because of the Indian belief that art should have a dimension in time while paintings, for instance, freeze the action of the subject in a single instant, music and dance unfold in time. Without sharing the religious resonances, I think many of us have experienced the moment of vivid presence in, say, the music of Ravi Shankar. What is important is the point made in yesterday's Times Art and Leisure section by Holland Carter, and I'm sure some of you read it, writing about Eastern art through Western eyes. He talked about the problems presented by Indian art because of the sculptural emphasis at a time painting was favored and because of its sexual content that shocked so many Victorians, probably a few senators today as well. Uh, there were religious incompatibilities as well and conflicts in worldviews, and things should have changed over time, says Cotter, uh, because of changes in our art forms and our attitudes. But then he asks whether the multiculturalist rhetoric in the art world represents a change of mind or simply a new way to misread and ignore certain kinds of non-Western art. He went on to speak of the lag in scholarship with regard to that art, the suspicion of religious meanings, the common insensitivity. Finally, he wrote, and this is what we need, I believe, to take seriously, even as we explore possibilities of new perspectives, new ways of seeing and hearing, multiple modes of looking at the world. The point he wrote is not that Western art history or contemporary theory is always wrong, but rather that it is just one version of right. Only when Westerners make the leap of projecting themselves into other very different cultures, rather than imposing their own ideas upon them, will the new art history 20 years on have truly earned its name. Our object, where public school children and young people are concerned, is to provide increasing numbers of opportunities for tapping into once unheard frequencies, for opening new perspectives on a world increasingly shared. It seems to me that we can only do so with regard for the situated lives of diverse children and respect for the differences in their experiences. But this need not mean shutting the doors to the possibility 
possibility of making music together. Not always the same music, not music governed by the same norms. The point seems to me to be experiential and not theoretical. My own experience opened when I first heard Ravi Shankar, who helped me as time went on listen to Philip Gloss, to attend to the Maharabhata and other works, to push back my horizons, to realize that there were multiple musics and multiple ways of making music together, and that I, a Western listener, was still entitled to listen to the musics of other cultures against my own lived situation on my own ground. It may be that someday we'll find our studies revealing what some scholars call a single calliope. Calliope was the daughter of the goddess of memory and of Zeus, and it was Calliope who gave us the gift of art. It may be that someday we will find a common unity shared by art around the world as more and more disparate artists work to imbue sensuous media with potent meanings. We've not yet found it, but we have found the wonders of difference, the wonders of diversity, and the possibility of experiencing the I and thou in particular cases and with regard to specific artworks as an emergent we. I believe this is more likely to happen if the participatory engagements we are involved with here become more likely in schools around the country. Working together to discover Indian dance movements, learning something about the importance of styles, young people may open themselves to the language of Indian dance on the basis of who they are and what they have been willing to explore. Some of us have had this experience with African dance, some with Mayan symbols and images in literature as well as visual art. We have not become African or adopted Mayan creeds, but some of us, along with the young strangers in our classrooms, have reached out as reflective knowers in a world changing daily, in the light of views from what used to be the margins, in the light of new eyes looking, new voices speaking. We all have to look out as persons somehow in pursuit, somehow leaning toward a future possibility. Empathy is required, the kind of empathy that imagination of all human capacities make po makes possible. An imaginative reaching out and toward is needed as we learn all of us, old and young, to look through more and more perspectives at what we hold in common and hear in common. And as using our imagination, we become better able to imagine what Cynthia Ozick describes as the familiar heart of the stranger. Opening ourselves then, putting one dimensionality aside in shallow conventions, we can nurture a desire for communitas, community, by means of art experiences while preserving differences. We need to affirm ourselves and touch our own horizons as we work to fuse with others, as we offer more and more pathways out of the fixed and ordinary, pathways toward what might be. I like what Saka wrote about pathways after writing that we all perceive things against the background of our own worlds. If the painter presents us with a field or a vase of flowers, he said, his paintings are windows which are open on the whole world. We follow the red path which is buried among the wheat much further than Van Gogh painted it among other wheat fields, under other clouds, to the river which empties into the sea, and we extend to infinity, to the other end of the world, the deep finality which supports the existence of the field and the earth, so that through the various objects which it produces, the creative act, he wrote, aims at a total renewal of the world. 
And now forgive me, I have a couple of minutes and I need to end with a woman's words, words written by a woman poet, Muriel Rukeyser, writing, yes, about Orpheus. And I found out she, last night she's written many poems about Orpheus and writing about things coming together with their own music. First, she tells of writing about dancing wild women singing. And she says it was a mask when she wrote of Orpheus. It was really herself, unable to speak, in exile from myself. And wonderfully, there is no mountain, there is no God, there is memory of my torn life, myself split open in sleep, the rescued child beside me among the doctors, and a word of rescue from the great eyes. No more masks, no more mythologies. Now for the first time the God lifts his hand, the fragments join in me with their own music. It's not only renewal, it is a wholeness for each of us and for ourselves. And thank you very much. Perhaps strangely, I choose to begin with the beginning of Hamlet, when the sentinels on the castle platform at Elsinore are uneasily asking each other to identify themselves. Who's there, asks Bernardo. Nay, answer me, says Francisco. Stand and unfold yourself. Long live the king, says Bernardo. Francisco, still uncertain, says Bernardo. And in some relief, Bernardo answers, he. There is something about that exchange that makes me think of the beginning of an encounter with a work of art. True West, a British painting, a Palabolus dance, Samuel Barber's summer music, the wind quintet. We can't know. We can't even know ourselves or what we will feel and discover when the lights go on and the action starts and we make out the road moving behind the trees. A space, a kind of empty imaginative space opens before us in our experience. Things are initially vague, as hard to decipher perhaps as the faces in the murky night at Elsinore. It is only when we begin attending, single out the details, the particulars, that the space begins to fill, <clears throat> and we begin charting our way somehow, reading what we are watching or listening to, grasping it and making it ours. There are other examples of what I have in mind, one from a novel we're reading in our workshop called The English Patient, in part about a mysterious pilot who fell from the sky with his helmet on fire over the African desert in the Second World War. He's picked up by nomads or Bedouins and carried through the sand. And at length, he is brought to a hospital in Pisa and at last to an abandoned hospital in a villa near Florence, where he's taken care of by one young nurse when the hospital staff evacuates the ruin at the end of the war. I find things in that novel that truly give rise to events in my consciousness that change me as potent metaphors will. The pilot in his childhood says he inhabited a landscape of trout streams and bird calls, which he recalls as a fully named world. Carried through the desert, his eyes are covered. He cannot recognize the signs. But there is more. Deserts for me, and probably for many of you, especially African deserts, are empty spaces of whiteness, totally unnamed. In this book, the desert is gradually named. It becomes the fertile lands of Cyrenaica, the salt marshes of El Algila. There are hidden towns and the sounds of musical instruments there are winds with names, a town called El Taj. There are Goron tribes who crush a food made out of colocynth. There are oases, names for a long, unnameable world. I said that I find in that a metaphor comparing what are on the face dissimilar. 
the desert becoming filled up with settlements and colors and moving nomads and dancing boys and figures in burnooses and the experience of those of us who find our lives being changed by active encounters with the arts. True West for me is another example of what can happen when a play becomes the object of a reflective consciousness, when it is rendered meaningful by an active noticing and offering of attention. Like the rest of you, I'm sure, I was brought up with movies about cowboys and Indians called Westerns. My present experience is replete with images emerging from California of earthquakes and riots and O.J. Simpson and Sunset Boulevards, the current West, pre presented as the true West to many of us these days. There is something like a desert in that array of images and what Lee in the play so haltingly calls cliche. A fictitiousness took it over long ago. And I reach back into the history I recall trying to recapture what? The real West of the settlements and the terrible journeys and the escapes from the Dust Bowl and the Golden Gate or the Golden Mountain made of artifices and too often false streams. And then like the rest of you, I engage with this play, I must say not for the first time, and I play the experience of seeing the stage world against the experience of the textual world I find in the printed book, which I suppose I read in part as a work of literature. Maybe for that reason, the connections I make as my imagination went to work weaving designs, making connections, creating new patterns were with the great Gatsby and the search for the green light the quest corrupted by the foul dust of the eastern air. And then I thought of Langston Hughes and the dream dying like a raisin in the sun. And then I remembered, partly because I teach these things, the presence of the wilderness in the American mind, the wild places, the places that had to be defended against by the building of a stockade or the building of a school or the building of small windowless log cabins where people could huddle in fear of windblown space and buffaloes and strangers rushing by on horses trying to reclaim the land. And out of all this and other memories and other associations, I became in some way participant in the action of True West with that desert be it called Dakota or the Mojave or Tornado or even Alaska, out there beyond the elevators, Austin is charged with riding and the computer and the toasters and the six packs and the plants that die in their particular foul dust if someone doesn't remember the, to the cold water and keeping them alive. Then with the two brothers battling, sublimating brotherly love and violence, as Americans have been so often wont to do, battling over whose version of the West is true, is saleable, is convincing, can be made into a movie, although not a film, we confront a terrible question about expressing, about articulation, about art itself, Lee has lived on the desert, has had an intimate relation with the wilderness, supposedly, but Lee has no language for telling about it. It is all fakery and wheezing and curses and yes, cliches. Austin, on the other hand, is the writer soaked in popular culture and bourgeois ordinariness. How can he render the truth out there where his father, toothless by now, drunk, alcoholic, has run to escape. Who can say it? Where is the true West? What is the connection between art and truth? When at the end, the two brothers, instead of killing each other, seem to merge to become one, dark and large against the big sky, they may, as they stagger together toward the Mojave, embody the contradictory, always problematic truth 
about the West and about America and about the American quest. We don't know. It can't be resolved. The questions beat and thud and hang there, and the spaces of our experience become fuller and more complex and richer and more full of contradiction. We breathe harder, perhaps, and this may be the intelligibility Dewey had in mind, as well as the source of questions, the questions with which searching and learning begin. Surely an experience, sh surely an experience like, like, like this uh, uh, it is a way of countering the anesthetic, the routine, the humdrum. Dewey talked so much about it's not only an hour and a half spent with the play, it's what is summoned up, what is incited to come alive and connect. That's what I meant by talk of possibility, of the unexpected surging up in experience. I could say, you could say, we will say kindred things about our encounter with Palabolus today or your own workshop work with shapes you never thought a human body could take with designs made by human limbs and shoulders and heads, as you will see until the very presence of the human body changes, shedding off all fixity, becoming itself a process, something changing, something becoming in space and time. I probably mentioned before a vision before a painting described by Jean-Paul Sartre while writing about how we all perceive things against the backgrounds of our own experience, about how things seem to open up from the vantage points of where we stand, from our lived situations. If the painter presents us with a field or a vase of flowers, he wrote, his paintings are windows which open on the whole world we, fo we follow the red path which is buried among other wheat fields under other clouds which empty into the sea and we extend to infinity, to the other end of the world, the deep finality which supports the existence of the field and the earth so that through the various objects which it produces, the creative act aims at a total renewal of the world. If this is true of the art of painting, of form and space and color, it's also true of music, the art of time. I think of the interplay of tonalities in Samuel Barber's piece, for example, and the openings that are the counterpoints. There is something in any case about a woodwind conversation for me that ends like many conversation with more to say, with a sense of something, some sound, some frequency beyond. It may be that way too with dance, as in the many movements of peach flower landscape, with that early image of the flowing stream, with the male figure fishing, maybe playing the flute, maybe rowing, carrying us along on a kind of gentle current among the farmers in the forest into ritual, and the stream again, moving, never stopping, leave, leaving us with flow and with becoming. But then a dance is never a fixed object. It is an art bound to performance, and performance is always an occasion of experience. The, the, uh, the something happens before us, whether we're watching a Balanchine ballet or an Ailey work or a Martha Graham, for Merce Cunningham, it goes this way. When I dance, it means this is what I am doing. It is the connection with the immediacy of the action, the single instant that gives the feeling of freedom. This is not feeling about something. This is a whipping of the mind and body into an action that is so intense that for the brief moment involved, the mind and body are one. He's talking about the kind of occasion that actualizes, that produces an immediate presence binding choreographer, dancers, audience, and music into a continuous whole. It is a process of body engagement, a process that establishes a world, 
through the body's moving presence. There is no sum summation in this play of powers, no end point. Movement, a stream, a process, moving always beyond, filling the empty space, yet not filling it, because the stream flows on and there is always more. So much of our gesturing, our thinking, even our understanding is ma made to seem about something. This stress on process, on movement, on the union of the mind and body seem to be of importance certainly to our personal lives as it is to the lives of those we teach. I always want to recommend a session of dancing before the young people sit down at their computers. Even as I want to enable young people to try to express through movement sometimes how they feel, what they desire, what they understand. It is another language, another way of naming, another way of overcoming the emptiness. It may or may not be a mode of intelligence, I don't know. But it has to do with our marking our spaces in time, generating the spaces, the medium of perceptual experience through movement. And there are connections, continuities, different from, but like some of those I experience in responding to True West. There are continuities within our bodies, with other bodies, with the environment, even with the cosmos. We can reach beyond through dance or through encounters with dance, imagining, <clears throat> feeling ourselves moving beyond, moving to wider and wider spaces, taking part, someone said, in cosmic control of the world. I've been trying to talk of how reflective encounters with the arts can open spaces for us, open perspectives on the given, enhance our sense of transaction with the human and the physical world around. Dewey talked of the rhythm that marked such transaction and said that the function of art is consciously to restore the union of sense, need, impulse, and action characteristic of the live creature. I appreciate a French writer, Michel Dufresne, who says, creation requires everything to stay in suspense as a gestation. In this sense, a work also is open, like a wound that does not heal. The rigor of perfection can become rigor mortis, to achieve it, the work risks being killed. And is it not to elude such solemn petrifaction that the work calls for a participation, which in accompanying it keeps the work alive? That's what we've been trying to talk about. The work of art does not conclude the matter of creation, but rather invites every individual to become a creator. I want to end this lecture by talking a little about the sense in which what we try to do through aesthetic education is to move persons to their own creativity by means of active and participant encounters with the arts. Again, much has to do with a willingness to lend the works their lives, to achieve them as, will, as meaningful by their own informed interpretation. Indeed, people can be helped to create by means of media, young and old flower, when given opportunities to inscribe images, to express their feelings in some significant language, to explore musical instruments and the sounds they make available for singing and saying. They find new energy, surely, when they discover modes of making patterns with their own bodies and movement. They find new energies as well in making a design, in solving the problems of form and color, in trying to make present an imagined end. The capacity to create in these ways has much to do with an ardent, aware being in the world, as it does with opening people of many ages to the creative work of those we call artists who have refined their craft, who cannot but write or paint or compose or choreograph, 
in order to reach others as they impose their own orders upon the world. I want to say again that participant engagements with works of art can themselves be creative experiences, especially if prepared for as you're prepared in the workshops. Creation doesn't imply a making out of nothing. It has to do with reshaping, renewing the materials at hand. Very often the materials of our own lives, our experiences, our memories. I believe many of you share with me the remarkable discovery that dimensions of your lives and life histories and pasts may be disclosed and highlighted by what you read and hear and encounter in the way of the arts. As Rilke said in one of his poems, the arts call to us, you must change your life. And the rest, we and those we teach are moved, as in few other circumstances, to pose the difficult questions and to choose. I want to end with a poem by Mark Strand called Seeing Things Whole because it is about moving ahead to fill the empty spaces, moving to keep things whole. In a field, I am the absence of field. This is always the case. Wherever I am, I am what is missing. When I walk, I part the air, and always the air moves in to fill the spaces where my body's been. We all have reasons for moving. I move to keep things whole. Thank you. Dr. Maxine Green has been Lincoln Center Institute's guiding beacon for nearly 30 years now. She has provided a philosophical foundation for our practice of aesthetic education, but also she has again and again renewed our enthusiasm, inspired us, and given us courage through sheer strength of her personality. She is our companion in an effort for an imaginative and intelligent education that teaches how to look at life through the prism of arts. It is a very special bond. Maxine has been a tireless writer and lecturer. Her lectures have always been stunningly up to date, dealing with equal passion and depth with the state of education and the state of the world. But whatever her thoughts, it is important to note that Maxine has always prodded us to make our own tracks. She doesn't wish to be quoted. She wants us to ponder her ideas, then use them as steps on our own path of exploration and expression. Individuality is a key word in her approach to aesthetic experiences. Lincoln Center Institute is glad to be able to share with you some of Maxine Green's thoughts. These lectures are part of the original collection in the book, Variations on a Blue Guitar which is in constant demand and has already been translated into Spanish and Mandarin. Dr. Green's ideas about the aesthetic experience and its place in education will continue to have a profound impact on our society as long as we care about the way our children learn and prepare for life. Having some of these ideas on DVD ensures that they will reach a greater number of people than we ever could have hoped for. I know you'll find Dr. Green's lectures as inspiring as we do. I, for one, am always moved by her words, whether she speaks of matters of utmost importance or the simple joys of everyday life. Now, of course, knowing Maxine, she would probably give me one of her sly looks and point out that the joys of everyday life are a matter of utmost importance. She is that kind of person. She is that kind of friend.
So much of our gesturing, our thinking, even our understanding is ma made to seem about something. This stress on process, on movement, on the union of the mind and body seem to be of importance certainly to our personal lives as it is to the lives of those we teach. I always want to recommend a session of dancing before the young people sit down at their computers. Even as I want to enable young people to try to express through movement sometimes how they feel, what they desire, what they understand. It is another language, another way of naming, another way of overcoming the emptiness. We experience a sense of surprise, oftentimes, an acute sense that things may look otherwise, feel otherwise, be otherwise than we have assumed. <clears throat> and suddenly the world seems new, with possibilities still to be explored. 